So we often fondly think of the mid to late 1990s up to the year 2000 as the golden age of JRPGs with Super Nintendo games and PlayStation 1 games really paving the way for what we have now. But what if I were to tell you that we might actually be living in another golden age, a new renaissance for JRPGs? So in today's video, we're gonna be talking about some games that I consider the new golden age of JRPGs. Of course, like I mentioned, there was the 1990s that was, you know, Super Nintendo, PlayStation 1 era, but I think maybe in 20, 30 years time, what we're living right now might be considered the new golden era or the JRPG renaissance. And very exciting because there's so much great stuff out there that we can play right now. As always, before we get to that, don't forget to like this video and subscribe and comment down below. Let me know what games you consider a part of the new JRPG renaissance. I'm very excited to know what you guys have to say. So we're gonna break this video down into a couple categories and going to talk about some games within those categories. So just based off of my experiences and what I've played, here's a few games that I think are going to define the new golden age of JRPGs. Let's go. So first up, let's talk about some of the high profile releases that have come out this year and super exciting because there's been a lot of great games this year alone that are just, you know, kind of newer titles. And I've played a handful of them just because, you know, I only have so much time to play games, of course. But the first high profile release for JRPGs or just RPGs in general, I suppose, was this year with Yakuza Like a Dragon Infinite Wealth. Now, I played this game with a little bit of experience from prior game in the series, um, you know, Like a Dragon. I, I really enjoyed it so much so that it sent me down this whole rabbit hole of playing the entire Yakuza a series, which is why you're seeing a lot more Yakuza stuff on my channel. But I played this game twice, once without the um, reference for the rest of the games. And then after I played the rest of the series, I went back and replayed it and really fleshed out a lot of curious stuff. But this was a really great game and expanding on some of the stuff like battles and the world overall, you know, with a new place in Hawaii, being able to explore that. It just seemed like a really great package overall. Some of the story elements I didn't 100% love, but in terms of gameplay, it, the, the gameplay loop was addictive. I loved the turn-based battles. It's something that you wouldn't think on paper would work, especially if you're a longtime Yakuza fan like I wasn't, because I actually came to the series first with the turn-based stuff. But I, I, you know, I really, I really enjoy this style of game. I like that there's different jobs or, or character roles that you can assign to your to your party. But you know what? I, I think this is a fantastic game. I can't wait to see what's next for the Yakuza series, of course. But I think overall, I do prefer the brawler style of game. I just think it, it fits the series better. But what we have here with Infinite Wealth was an incredibly polished experience. Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. I've been waiting for this game since Remake. I couldn't wait to see what they had done for the story. I was very happy with um, with the game overall. Obviously, it's kind of left me waiting for the third part for story reasons, of course, if you know, you know. But overall, I think it was a really great game. I mean, even if we look at the battle system, which we thought couldn't have been improved upon, they did improve upon it, just made it better overall. Some visual issues with the, with the PS5, you know, performance mode and graphics mode. You know, if you're kind of into that, you'll understand. But it didn't really bother me necessarily because because I played a majority of the game on my PlayStation portal. I really loved this game. I love what they did. I love how they fleshed out the world in Final Fantasy VII Rebirth, just in a way that I wasn't really expecting, really made it feel more full. And instead of being a more linear experience like Remake was, Rebirth felt like a giant open world, You know, being able to run from one end of the map to the other very seamlessly. I loved this game. Okay, and last on the high profile releases of this year before we move on is gonna be Metaphor Refantasio or Refantasio. I don't know. I actually haven't heard anybody say this because I haven't watched any videos on it until um, you know, making this video right now. So before we talk about the game, I want to say thank you to Sega for providing me with a review code. Um, you know, I'm I'm about 30 hours into the game so far, and I'm actually surprisingly really enjoying my experience. I haven't played any persona games yet. I actually bought Persona 5 Royal to play, but then this came out and I was like, oh, I better play this first. It actually seems like um, a Final Fantasy game and a Persona game had a baby, more or less, and this is coming from somebody who hasn't played a Persona game, but I'm really enjoying my time with this. There's a lot of classic elements to this game. It's turn-based. It's kind of like dungeon crawling. I really like that there are some elements of being able to hack and slash your enemies that are obviously lower leveled, so you can get through the dungeons a lot more quickly. There's the archetype system, which is more or less the job system. The story, I think, is kind of a slow burn. I'm seeing some people get hooked into it within the first hour or two. I mean, I've played it now almost 30 hours, so I'm obviously interested in the story. I don't think I'm emotionally invested um, in a way that I want to be, but I think this is a really great game overall. And if you haven't played anything like this, or if you're seeing a lot of people talk about Metaphor, this is a really great game, honestly. So I could I could, I could actually highly recommend this. And I think this is going to cap off um, the year for high profile JRPG releases. Obviously, I'm not going to spoil any story stuff, but it's just very interesting. I like the concept. I like the art style as well. A lot of the cutscenes are, are very uh, anime 
And uh, if you like that style of stuff, I think you're really going to love this game. And it, you know what? It runs really great on my Steam Deck. So um, thank you to Sega for providing me with the code. So I can at least chat about this. If you guys want more of my thoughts, let me know down below in the comments if you want like a full length metaphor review or, or thoughts video. But yeah, I think this is one of the best games this year. And it's just coming off the back of so many great games this year. Now let's talk about remasters and ports. This is a really great time to be a JRPG fan because we're now seeing a lot of beloved classics brought back with quality of life improvements, graphic enhancements. This is giving players the chance to experience older iconic titles and remind longtime fans why these games are beloved. And it's gonna refine the experience, obviously with new features and stuff. So I think this is a great time to pick up, for example, Persona 3 Reload. I've seen a lot of people talk about that. I, again, I haven't played a Persona game, but I know this is one of the ones that have come out this year that a lot of people have really just championed and said, you know what, this is great. I love this. There's a lot of updated graphics, reworked mechanics, quality of life stuff, making it one of the more anticipated remakes or remasters of 2024. I do wanna get into this game once I finish Metaphor, there's just a, a lot that I'm juggling at the moment, but Persona 3 Reload is one that I know a lot of people have talked positively about. And coming up here in the next few weeks is Dragon Quest 3 HD. I'm very excited to finally get into this because I've never played a Dragon Quest game aside from Dragon Quest 11 on the Switch. That was an amazing 80 hour experience. Obviously, I'm not expecting that kind of stuff from Dragon Quest 3 HD, but I am expecting a really cool experience that hopefully will introduce me to the rest of the Dragon Quest series. And of course, after that, I I'll be very excited to play 1 and 2 HD. And very soon we have the Suikoden in 1 and 2 remaster. This is a series that I've been holding off on. I've been wanting to play forever. I wanted to actually buy Suikoden in 2 on PlayStation, but you know, you, you have to kind of take out a home loan to, to afford one of these games, um, which is quite a shame, honestly. So these remasters are not only giving new players the opportunity to play these games, but also kind of doing it in an affordable way, of course, uh, you know, opposed to the physical stuff from the 90s, which is yeah, uh, insanely expensive. So I'm looking forward to this. And one of my favorite titles of last year, which was actually my JRPG of the year last year, was Star Ocean The Second Story R. I really loved that game. That was an amazing experience, which you can play as either Claude or Reyna. They kind of play through the same story, but they have their own individual arcs with you know, some characters that they can recruit. I really loved the battle system in that. It's really fun. I think you can level your characters up to like level 200 or something. It was it, honestly, the, the hours flew by playing that game. And a lot of these games with remasters, of course, if they're being um, ported or, or remade in, in a way that they're the HD 2D look. And it's a look that I've really come to enjoy and I think Star Ocean, the second story, are really set the benchmark high for what we can expect for those kind of games. I think it's just beautiful and uh, very visually stunning. So the, a lot of the remasters and, and ports that we've seen over the last even year or so are really great, visually stunning, giving players a new way to play these games and make them accessible. You know, you can play it on your Steam Deck like I have been. You play it on Switch even as well, some of them. And uh, yeah, just looking forward to some more stuff coming out here soon. There's, there, there's always great stuff around the corner for ports and remasters. Hang on, if you guys enjoyed JRPG discussions, week in and week out, focused videos, reviews, top tens, rankings, Hey, I would love to have you here as we explore all that stuff. So don't forget to hit that subscribe button because almost 90% of the people who watch this channel on the regular are not subscribed. Anyway, let's get on to the next category by talking about a inspired by game that I'm sure a lot of you out there love. Sea of Stars is a game that's heavily inspired by Chrono Trigger, of course, even getting, you know, one of the original composers from Chrono Trigger, Yasunori Matsuda, to do the soundtrack. So, of course, it's going to draw heavy comparisons between those two games, and I already made a video on that way earlier in the year last year, um, so go check that out if you want. But Sea of Stars is a game that's inspired by Chrono Trigger and you know, Mario RPG and some other 16-bit classics, combining nostalgic turn-based combat with some modern twists. It also incorporates timing-based inputs during attacks like, you know, the Mario stuff, making combat more interactive and engaging, blending exploration with puzzle solving, kind of like a Golden Sun-esque thing, which is a little bit unusual in JRPGs, and hence why I reference Golden Sun, because you haven't really seen stuff like that since. Um, yeah, the storytelling fell a little bit flat for me. Um, some of the characters I didn't really love, but the gameplay was great. The visuals were really great. The music was great. I just found that the story lacked emotional depth, but I, I, I enjoyed the game overall. I'd probably say it's a game that I would, you know, maybe say the seven out of 10, but it's it's great to see what people are doing and in interpreting that classic JRPG formula and, you know, making a brand new game with it. So Sea of Stars was something that I was really, really hyped about. And I know a lot of people loved this game. 
It personally didn't land with me, but I think it's still great that we're seeing stuff like this come out and people are very excited about it. It just goes to show that, yes, you know, people are getting excited by some of the inspired by stuff. Now let's talk about the rise of indie JRPGs. Indies are a really great way to play brand new stories that you never would have considered. There's so many independent developers pouring their hearts out in games that are just different than what you would see from a AAA dev. And the first one I wanna highlight here is 8-Bit Adventures 2. This is developed by Critical Games. I've actually spoken with the developer, Josh, um, on my turn-based podcast just to learn a little bit more about the experience of creating a game like this. And it's something that these developers really care so much. If you like classic style JRPGs, I would highly recommend checking out 8-Bit Adventures 2. So of course, this is taking a um, Super Nintendo NES route, embracing the 8-bit aesthetic while incorporating a lot of modernized gameplay and storytelling. This serves as a direct sequel to 8-Bit Adventures 1, expanding on its story and gameplay mechanics, but it's also designed to be a standalone game for new players. And this is now available on Switch and PS4, PS5, etc. And Xbox, so this is something that you can go get. And it's a game that's not super expensive either. So if you like turn-based combat, vibrant pixel art, and great character-driven stories, and despite its retro look, 8-Bit Adventures 2 has a lot of quality life improvements, like adjustable difficulty, accessible interface. It's, you know, blending that old-school charm with a polished, modern experience. And this is what we can get from indie devs, you know, pushing games out like this. Another game that I have that I haven't really played a lot of is Chained Echoes. Now, a lot of people speak very, very highly of this game. I've played maybe two or three hours of it. It didn't work 100% on my Steam Deck the day that it came out, so I haven't played it actually since it released, but I enjoyed what I played. I loved the approach to the battle system. It's very unique having like a cooldown system, I think. Um, and yeah, a lot of people speak very highly of it. So if you like stuff like Xenogears, you might like the deep story in there. And the cool thing is, is like these games are all made by, you know, a very small team of people or Chained Echoes, I think was made by one guy which is very impressive, you know, beautiful sprite artwork, great story arc, great gameplay. So I look forward to getting back to Chained Echoes at some stage. And the last one here that I'll talk about today is Alzara Radiant Echoes. I actually spoke to the studio director, Emma, when the Kickstarter was like a couple days into the campaign and I was very excited about that. It's very vibrant. It's set in a Mediterranean world, so it has a different vibe than a lot of these other games as well. And this is something that they speak very highly of, you know, being inspired by Golden Sun. They have the composer from Golden Sun coming on board here. You've got the character designer and an artist behind like some of the Fire Emblem stuff. So it's a very AAA looking game, but it's obviously a, you know, a smaller independent developer. And that's why sometimes these devs need to reach out to Kickstarter to help finish the games because it, it takes a lot of money to, um, you know, fund these games and create these games and create new experiences for us. But it looks very Golden Sun inspired. But when I when I spoke to Emma in the conversation, you know, these are just things to kind of say to get people in the idea or the mind frame of, of maybe what to expect. But it's not going to be a, a copy of Golden Sun. It's not going to be a copy of like Final Fantasy X, for example, being set kind of like in a Mediterranean area. You know, these are just, you know, ideas to think of, you know, here's what our game might be like, more or less. And this is a game that I've backed, so I'm very happy to to recommend people following the development of this. And uh, I'm very excited for this to come out. I think it might be out maybe in the next two years. But again, th there's so many great indie games coming out that are just paving the way for brand new experiences that sometimes you're just not getting from AAA developers. So there's just a few games that I think are now pioneering the way or paving the way forward for the new JRPG renaissance, the new golden era of JRPGs. It's very exciting. What a great time to be a gamer, but also a bad time to have money because it just seems to be flying out of my wallet. Honestly, it's I can't afford all these games. I'm broke. <laughs> so anyway, thanks again for watching this video. I appreciate you guys hanging around. Don't forget to like and subscribe, comment down below, and we'll see you again on the next one. Bye bye.